And contrary to what people think, life is not a beach. In fact, it's like having a front row seat in the theater of the Abzad. A lot of absurd things happen at the beach, particularly every weekend. And one of the most meaningless rituals that I find is this act of beach cleanups. There's not a single month that passes by without some corporate funded initiative for cleaning up the beaches. I find it meaningless, I find it futile, I find it hugely problematic. What are these kids doing? Are they cleaning up or are they dirtying up? Because what we call clean up essentially means moving garbage from one place to another. There's nothing more to it. You're cleaning up what you consider a valuable space, a valued space used by valued people, and then you dump it in a place that you consider valueless, occupied or used by people we don't value. And this meaningless ritual just got a national campaign status in 2014, when the government of India decided to recruit some magic to make our garbage disappear. But Harry Potter is not real, that broom has no magic, and your garbage won't disappear. What we call a cleanup, and where we, when we go around deluding ourselves that we are solving a big world's problem, or cleaning up the Besanaga beach, or some of the value in space, we are actually engaging in a casteist, racist, discriminatory act. And that is why I think it is not just a false solution, but it's hugely problematic because we are te teaching our kids the wrong things. Such false solutions are only possible in unequal societies. In an equal society, you cannot just swatch your Bharat and dump it on some unsuspecting community. These false solutions are hugely problematic. They're all around us, but they're hugely problematic because they usually make an appearance when we are in the middle of a crisis. Usually we allow these problems to build up to crisis levels, and then we call for an emergency measure, and that's when the false solutions make an appearance. You can't fight them because they are sexy. They are low effort. Don't demand much effort, much change of bad habits from our side. And so they also tend to postpone the real solution. Think about the Chennai's water crisis. This is not a new thing for Chennai. I mean, anybody who's lived in Chennai long enough has grandparents knows that Chennai was born into a water crisis. But about a month ago, one of the, we started having a range of false solutions making an appearance. So one of the things I remember was a media house actually talking about jubilation on the streets of Chennai and people dancing on the streets of Chennai because there was a train arriving from Jolar Pete carrying water. So for a city as a child, I remember doing the rain dance to welcome the first monsoon showers. Now we do the train dance to welcome water coming in from Jolar Pete. So these are real problems. And one of the things that I've noticed when I speak either at an audience like this, or mostly I speak to people who are under 30 years of age, and I might be talking about very weighty problems, very existential issues, climate change, climate catastrophe, ecosystems in decline, eroding biodiversity, I mean, really dark and gloomy things. And then people pipe up with, somebody's bound to pipe up with a very simple question. So what's the alternative? What's the solution? Solution to what? The climate crisis? We don't take time to define the problems right. And even if we end up defining the problems right, the answers scare us. So what do we do? We just define the problem wrong because we have convenient answers and we go with the convenient answers. I'll give you an example. This is something that all of us will relate to. Plastics is something that all of us love, all of us hate, all of us love to hate, hate to love, all those combinations. And with plastics, what is the problem? The problem is it is non-degradable. You're not going to be able to change that. It is indestructible. So even if you lay a road with plastics, it will become microplastics and end up in the environment. It is toxic. The entire life cycle is toxic. From its birth to its death. The disposal, it is toxic. It cannot be safely burnt, processed, composted, buried, at all. And so what conventional wisdom would tell you is if you cannot safely process it, compost it, bury it, or burn it, then don't make it. But that question, that answer is not good for us. So what do we do? We say, we will try to solve it differently. So over the last 70 years that plastics have been in existence, we've had a whole range of really weird solutions making an appearance. Shoot it into space, make islands of it, upcycle it to make beautiful things that nobody wants. You have a whole range of these kind of cock and bull solutions. But if you spend 70 years throwing every solution that you have at a problem, and you still haven't solved it, then your challenge isn't in finding the right solution. It is in finding the right problem. 
you take the question of plastics again, we have an industry that is churning out about 400 million tons of plastics every year into the market. The market means your environment. Of this 400 million tons, 8 million tons ends up into your oceans. That's about one container truck filled with toxic trash entering the oceans every minute. This is not going to reduce. So while you are sending your children to the beach to swatch the Bharat one plastic bag at a time, the industry is actually going to be ratcheting up its production from 400 million to 1,600 million tons by the year 2050. And what are we doing? We have a land of unthinking people, and so false solutions are a growth industry. We have a whole range of false solutions making an appearance. One of my favorites is this non-governmental organization that claims to collect all the plastics from the oceans. The world's oceans cover 70% of our surface area, and this body wants to collect the plastics. And on its website, between 2017 and 2019, they claim to have collected 3,404 tons. That's about four minutes worth, sorry, four seconds worth of production. This reminds me of my garbage guru, Dr. Paul Connett, who once told me a story about this man who was trying to stop this bathtub from overflowing. So he took a small mug and started bailing it out. The tub was still overflowing. He took a bucket and went at it, still overflowing. He put in a pipe connected to an electric pump, and he sucked out the water, ended up flooding his bedroom. So his wife walked in and turned off the tap. You know where the tap is. The tap is the 400 million um, tons a year, the 1,600 million tons a year, and these are big tabs with very big people. So despite the fact that false solutions are so apparently false and so apparently hurtful to certain communities and other environments, why do we go after them? Why do we think it's viable? One of the key reasons for that is externality and the other is invisibility. Externality is where what you call a solution has negative consequences on somebody else. You clean up the Besanaga beach, dump it on Kodungayur. Dump it on the place where other people live. Invisibility is where Kodungayur is invisible, either because of the distance or because of its political marginalization. These two things make false solutions appear really good. What we call development actually involves a toxic trade-off. Actually, that's a misnomer, because a trade-off means I lose something in order to gain something. The irony about development is I gain something, but I'll make you lose something, or somebody else lose something. And if you take the, the, the example of Chennai, the city, not just Chennai, but most cities, almost make it appear as if they have a right to grow, and their right to grow is like a force of nature that cannot be challenged. There is no alternative. So what do we do? The city says, I will grow. I just want to know how to sustain infinite growth. We never ask, how much can the city grow, given that you're sitting in a place that is already water stressed. And as a result, what happens? We start looking for land, and when land is not available, we start occupying water. And so this is the Palikarne marshland. There's a portion of it. It's about 50 square kilometers. It has a catchment, or it drains an area of about 250 square kilometers. There's a lot of talk about rainwater harvesting. This is rainwater harvesting. If you take the 250 square kilometer catchment, that is the size of the roof. The 50 square kilometer Palikarne marshland is the container. And here we are talking about our piddly little roofs and asking for rainwater harvesting in that. If you lose this, all your rainwater harvesting at home is not going to be do doing any good to us. So in this marshland, we decided to carve out 265 acres and hand it over to IT companies. And we call the IT companies the knowledge industries. These are the smart ones. And would smart people build inside a water body? No. But these smart ones have built inside a water body, and they got flooded. This is the Vela Cherry tank, must have been built about 600, 700 years ago, has been left unencroached, unbuilt, because that's a place reserved for water. What did we do? We built our houses inside it. And then we called it flooding. Lakes don't flood, lakes get filled up. If you build inside a lake, your house will get filled up. This is the Kodingayur tank, another large tank. And this I show because Often it is said that Chennai's problems are because of unplanned urbanization. No. There is a deliberate planning to this. If you look at this right-hand slide, you will see there are straight lines. If you see straight lines, then you know that engineers have been at work. 
It is not only planned, we've actually borrowed money from the World Bank to fill up our lake. This is my favorite. This is a very valuable recharge zone. It's a natural infrastructure. All the white you see is sand, which means that's a place that just sucks up the water. All the black that you see spread out like tentacles are the places through which water comes rushing in from three directions. You leave it alone, all the water that falls on your ground will be soaked in, and then only after the soil is completely soaked will the water flow over and enter the canal. What do we do to it? We built a knowledge industry on top of it. There's a Siriseri ITSEZ with very smart people building, including the Chennai Mathematical Institute is in there. And what is really ironical is some of these buildings even have green certification because they have rainwater harvesting. How dumb is that? <laughs> so identifying small solutions is not that difficult a deal, actually. Uh, if you're educated, it might be difficult, but if you have common sense, quite easy. One of the key things in this is that False solutions often make an appearance very simple interventions for extremely complex problems. Take the example of Chennai's water crisis. It is not a result of one single thing. It is a result of where we are, the fact that we have exceeded our limits and are living unsustainably. There is un unsustainable consumption and overconsumption by some and underconsumption by others, so there's in inequitable access. You have leaking pipes, you have leaking metro water lorries, you have pollution. You have a whole range of different concepts, different factors. And how do we decide to solve this? By a desalination plant or by a train from Jolar Pete. The second is the whole thing that these kinds of false solutions will have an impact, maybe not on you, but on somebody else. And for this, immediately we come up with this whole idea that you can't have an omelet without breaking an egg. The question that we have to ask is, whose egg are we breaking and who gets to eat the omelet? The third hallmark of a false solution is that they tend to maintain the status quo. They will not disturb the status quo. Any solution that does not disturb this perverted normal is not worth having. The status quo is where the rich overconsume and the poor don't get to get anything. That is not disturbed. We just told that you can consume, but now it'll be fat-free, guilt-free, toxic-free consumption. And finally, most of these, what we call as uh, solutions, false solutions, take the form of techno fixes. They are technological interventions that will come to, you can, you can throw any problem at them, it'll be a technological fix. Grandmother's arthritis, technological fix. Your water problem, the fact that you've lost your relationship with nature, technological fix. So these techno fixes often replace your democracy with technocracy or technology. A global, a local solution with a global solution or a global intervention. And often, and most dangerously, they replace wisdom with cleverness or in today's day and age of smart cities, smartness. So next time somebody asks you, can you please solve this problem, or can you give me a solution, first spend time trying to define the problem right. Because if you define the problem right, you may not even need to solve it. Wise people avoid the problems, and clever people run around like headless chicken trying to solve a problem. Thank you.